Sal Khan's response to the crisis in education is KhanAcademy.org, a site that lists a vast and growing collection of his YouTube video lessons in math, physics, chemistry, biology, and economics. In this conversation with Interviews with Innovators host John Udell, he discusses his teaching philosophies and methods and explains why he abandoned a career in financial services to become a new kind of teacher. From IT Conversations. <laughs> Hi, and welcome to IT Conversations. I'm Phil Wendley, the executive producer. Today I'm happy to bring you another program from John Udell's Interviews with Innovators. This program is made possible by Microsoft's Channel 9 and Channel 10. Our audio files are delivered by Limelight Networks, the high-performance content delivery network for digital media. The Conversations Network is a 501c3 nonprofit, and we need your help. For a tax-deductible donation of as little as $5 per month, you can support this channel and the rest of the Conversations Network. So please visit conversationsnetwork.org to become a member and help us continue to bring our programs to the world for free. And now, here's John Udell. I saw something online the other evening that reminded me of what you're doing in an interesting way, so it might be a fun place to start. There's an artist in Los Angeles named Richard Ankrum. And somewhere around 2000 or 2001, he got pissed off about the fact that there's this freeway intersection in Los Angeles that's very poorly labeled. And in particular, there was a key missing piece of information, which was a, a place where there should have been a sign that said North 5. It, was just, it just wasn't there. And so <laughs> he went and made a, a North 5 sign to the the highway department's specifications. Then he made himself a, a uniform and then he got up on a ladder and he went out and he installed the thing. <laughs> and, and, and he, uh, he calls this guerrilla public service as in guerrilla, the freedom fighter, not guerrilla, the, yeah. the great ape. Um, and, you know, since then, as far as I know, it's still up and, uh, you know, probably millions of people have, have benefited from that. And right. it just reminded me of, of what you're doing in, in a way in the realm of education, which is sort of looking at a situation and, and thinking, you know what, I'm just going to go do something about that. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and, you know, thanks to the, the technology uh, of the Internet, I can be a super empowered individual. And there really is essentially no limit to how far that can scale out and how many people I can help. It's it's really yeah. a wonderful thing. So so you yeah. know, tell us about the about the Khan Academy. Yeah, so I, it's most known for the the roughly twelve hundred videos on YouTube. It's it's being mirrored other places, and other people are distributing it offline. But uh, YouTube's got really the main way that that people access the videos, and uh, it really started off very organically. I was I was. Um, uh, helping out cousins and family members, and and I just and, and it seemed to be working well. I was uh, uh, tutoring them remotely. I was in Boston. They were I'm in in Northern California now, but uh, uh, they were in New Orleans. And and w when I was doing this one on one tutoring with them, it seemed to be very effective. And I just kept thinking of how could I make it scale. And yeah. and uh, there's actually a software piece that I started working on at first. And I, and a buddy of mine said, Hey, why don't you put some some videos in the software? And and by the time I got over the idea that I didn't think of it, uh, I, I I I started recording a couple of videos. And the videos are what uh, what what really took off. I think it's just the, the low barrier for people to use it. Even my own cousins say that I'm I'm better on YouTube than I am live. Uh, they can <laughs> pause and pause and repeat me, and and they don't feel like the video is judging them the way I. <laughs> so uh, so yeah, and, and uh, I I put it out there, and and uh, you know I, I think as a, as a fellow software engineer, you can appreciate how fun it is when people actually use something you've built. And and uh, what when I just put it out there, you know, I've written hundreds of pieces of software that that absolutely no one uses, and, and just put a couple of YouTube videos out there, and within a day, at least when I started. 20 or 30 people were using them and some subset of them would write a note saying, hey, I got an A on my algebra exam because of this or, um, you know, I, I feel prepared to go back to college next year. Or, you know, and some of them were, you know, I was going to drop out until I saw something like this. And so, so you just get one note like that. You're like, wow, this is more impact than I've ever had doing anything else. So I, I just kept making the videos and uh, the traffic just kept picking up organically and, and it, it started to be, uh, become pretty clear that, that there was a, a need being addressed. And so you've actually decided to try to reconfigure your life or you have reconfigured your life around this away from, I guess, most recently financial services. Yeah, I was uh, – when I started doing this, I was originally – 
tutoring my cousin Nadia in New Orleans. Uh, they they had just visited me in Boston after my wedding. I was a, a hedge fund analyst in Boston, and and I was a hedge fund analyst until this past uh, September, and uh, to a large degree, even while I was while my day job was was in 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 finance, I had already reconfigured my life around this. I was uh, pretty much every every waking moment where where I felt that my wife wouldn't feel that I was being completely <laughs> delinquent of my family duties. I would uh, I would sneak away and start doing YouTube videos, or I'd also work on the software that would give people exercises to do, uh, and so I could track what they were doing. And uh, so so it was really uh, I've kind of just come to terms with the fact that this is, this is what I, what I think I should be doing all the time. So in September I quit my job and, and I've been doing it full time and, and, and I haven't looked back since, although I'm, uh, uh, although my, my bank account is <laughs> slowly depleting. So hopefully I'll figure out a way to, to make that at least, uh, uh not deplete. I, I am certain that you will. And, and, uh, I hope that people who will be listening to this can maybe help with that because this is clearly what you should be spending your time doing. And I, I think you've written somewhere that you, you, you realized this was the way that you could have the most leverage and, and do the most good and have the most fun. And Oh yeah. Right? I, 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 if you just think about it, it's actually, it's, it's my, it's such a simple thing. You know, I could do a video on, uh, you know, the, the fundamental theorem of calculus and it might take me, you know, maybe t- is something I knew before I even started doing this. So I don't have to pr- prepare much and it takes me 10 or 20 minutes to do the video. And then I put it up there and literally, millions of people for as long as the internet exists can use that video and 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 you know my or your great grandchildren could use that video so i mean just just in terms of the return on time invested or the return on you know uh, mental capital invested however you want to view it it's 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 mind boggling yeah well it's it's an astonishing amount of leverage but this is also what this also points to is that you know i was watching a, a ted talk uh, that bill gates gave recently and in part of it he was discussing education and you know from the software business that there's this meme about there being a really big difference between an average software engineer and a great software engineer and it's not just you know like twice as good it's you know order of magnitude difference or at least this is the claim and and he was making that same argument in the realm of education and and that right. the gates foundation had had been looking into this and had concluded that it's the same right that they're you know that there are some teachers who are just way way better than average and and you know how can we leverage that and this is i mean what what you're doing is a perfect illustration of of how we could leverage that but i want to kind of ask you about uh you know i mean clearly you're a great teacher and you love to do it um but you know when did you sort of realize that and 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 what is it about you and and how you think and and how you um present things and and how you communicate, you know, I mean, have you analyzed what it is that you think is effective? I, I, I've tried to, I, I've obviously, uh, I mean, a lot, of, I, I, you know, I, I think about that myself. It's not the idea of, of, uh, putting instruction on on the web and, and letting people use it isn't a new one. I wasn't the first person to think of it, uh, and so I do introspect a lot as to why uh, th- these videos have seemed to kind of struck a chord with people and, and gotten a lot of traction. Uh, I think it's a couple of things. I mean, just you know, you, you ask about just you know when did I realize, and I think growing up, I was, and I think this is probably true of a lot of people who, uh, uh, you know, it's probably true of yourself or a lot of people who do well in the math and sciences that they. They, they they kind of go beyond what's going on in the classroom and they make connections on their own. And if anything, they, they get frustrated by what goes on in the classroom, that mm-hmm. they see otherwise intelligent peers memorizing facts and not really caring about uh, the actual intuition. And because they didn't care about the intuition in their junior year, when that, that same idea pops up in the senior year, it's, it, it, it's like they've never seen it before. And, and, and it, would, it would boggle my mind. It's just, you know, you're relabeling the same concept over and over. So I've always had that frustration. I've always been someone that always like to ponder what I was learning as opposed to, and it, it, sometimes it was at my detriment because, you know, you only have so, so much time in your day and you can either do what the, what the teacher tells you to do or you can ponder and mm-hmm. the pondering might pay off in the long term, but the uh, not doing what the teacher tells you to do will, might not, will, will hurt you in the short term. But uh, uh, that, that was kind of my frustration with my education throughout high school and, and college. I was kind of the guy who skipped class a lot and just try to read a book and then read other books and, and talk to my friends about the concept as opposed to necessarily going to classes just because I, I felt that I was either lost in class or I was bored in class. And it was very, mm-hmm. it was maybe, you know, on a good class, I would, maybe there would be 10 minutes where I was actually, it was, it was catering to me. And, and so it was a very, uh, that, that was also a frustrating experience. And it, it, it really felt like there was a, that there, there must be a better way. And so when I started tutoring my cousin, uh, Nadia, you know, it, 
I started tutoring her as kind of a, a friend uh, or a cousin as opposed to a teacher. Uh, and I think, I think that tone, if I had to pick one thing that, that has, has kind of resonated with people, it's, it's this tone that, you know, I got a, a note the other day on the YouTube channel where, you know, you teach more like a friend than a teacher. And yeah, conversational you, know, you, tone. You, you can interpret that in multiple ways. But I think that's, I think that's the, the core issue that the tone doesn't turn people off. I think uh, the, the next thing is, is what I touched on in, in my own experience is that I, I'm really big on making connections. I get a lot of letters and, and you can almost sense the anger from the students mm -hmm. where, where they communicate that their teachers think that they're making it easier for the students by not giving the intuition, by not giving the, the depth or making the connections because they, they kind of think that the students just need to learn the mechanics. But uh, I get letter after letter saying, because you get the intuition, because you, you give the common sense why this, you know, why this is just a mathematical way of, of expressing something that makes a lot of sense, it actually becomes a lot more easy and a lot, a lot more intuitive. And, uh, and I think if you combine that with uh, YouTube, it, it used to limit me to 10 minutes and I've gotten letters from researchers telling me that it's been established that nine minutes is about as long as someone can really focus and pay attention without kind of taking a mental break. And so, so I give credit to YouTube for that. I, I now can record a little bit longer than, than 10 minutes, but uh, I think that's a big thing. And I think the, the other thing, this was just a complete side effect of me trying to do it as cheaply as possible without fancy video equipment is you don't see my face. And I've been told by a lot of people that that keeps it from being a distraction. Mm -hmm. And, and it actually makes it very easy for me to make the videos. I don't have to shave or wash my face <laughs> before I make every video. You know, I just have to make sure. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's – uh, So the process, the process that you use is apparently – delightfully low tech. It looks to me, well, you should say, but it looks to me like you're, you're using tools as simple as maybe Windows Paint and, and or I don't know what, but it's, it's nothing fancy, right? No, the first when I the, the first time where I decided to make the videos, I said, "Well, how can I make a decent video for my cousins?" And I literally, I took Microsoft Paint, uh, put made the background black, uh, just because I thought it would look nice, like a chalkboard. And uh, I, I used some uh, shareware screen capture software. It was like you know, uh, free for twenty days, and then you got to pay twenty dollars after that. And, yeah. Uh, I, I got myself a twenty dollar headset and a, and a sixty dollar uh, Wacom pen tablet, and 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 I started doing it. And actually, the the production quality was. Pretty good. The first, I would say, four or five hundred videos were done exactly like that. And I mean, you can see if you see some of the earlier videos. Yeah, I'm now upgraded uh, slightly, but not really that much. One of the users just sent me a, a license to uh, Camtasia. I think there's other things I could use as well that would do screen tap, screen capture fairly well. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I now use a, a, sl a slightly better art program that at least you know it's a little bit sensitive to, to pressure on the pen tablet, but it's uh, it's still pretty low tech. Yeah, exactly. And. Well, well, it's interesting because when I, I got started, I, I was actually, um, I, if you look on Wikipedia, I'm the person whose name is associated with the word screencast because I got interested in that stuff <laughs> some, some years ago and um, actually ran a little, because I, I was making these software demos um, using Camtasia and its predecessors and got really interested in that process. And so at a certain point, I got to where I was making really pretty highly produced kinds of things that were tightly edited. And it, that was interesting, you know, to do right. that process. But um, at a later point, I started to rethink that. And um, at one at one moment, I remember a, a, a friend of mine, his name is Chris Gemignani, and he's, uh, he's a, an analytics and visualization person. And every once in a while, he makes these um, screencasts to show people things that he can teach them in, in say Excel. And he made one of these and it was full of stops and starts and, uh, Oh, you know, I didn't mean to do it that way. And, and let's back up and, and try another path. And we talked about it afterward. And he, um, he said, you know, I, I felt like I should edit that stuff, but then I realized in a way that if I did, then I wouldn't be giving people the true insight into the process of how I think right. about these things and, and how my and how I do these things. And so the in fact the unedited style wound up being better. And I think maybe that's true for you too. Oh absolutely. Yeah. I mean that's 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 actually you know if I that's probably one of the top three in terms of why I mean it was really out of laziness initially. I was uh, you know it was, it was for my cousins. I was like, you know, who 
I don't care what they think. <laughs> I'm doing this out of my own. So I would put it out there if I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't do the problem before I made the video. So they saw me doing the problems the first time. And every now and then I would go down one route and, and say, oh, wait, 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 that's not right. And I would back up a little bit. And that's something, frankly, that no one ever sees. You don't, your, your lecturer mm -hmm. in your, in your, in your high school trigonometry class, they have done the problem ahead of time or they have the solution in front of them. And so you just see the finished product. You don't actually see the thought process. And I think to actually see someone stumble around a little bit, mm -hmm. who you respect, who you, you know, you realize knows what they're doing, but still they stumble around and see kind of the art of solving a problem, I think is, is uh, something you'll never see in a, in a traditional lecture or textbook. And so that might also imply that you do relatively less prep than another person might imagine would be necessary because, because thinking on your feet is part of the process. It's just part of the, yeah. I've now kind of embraced that idea. Now that there's more viewership, I almost feel like I should prepare more and make it more polished. But I I kind of fight that that uh, that that instinct, and I and I, I still want to keep them relatively raw. I mean, I want to I want to make them easy to watch. But you you really want to. Uh, I get a lot of letters. And people appreciate these. Uh, you know, I've there's the uh, College Board SAT book, and I did all 400 math problems, and I literally did them in real time. So yes, you're, you're literally like sitting on my shoulder while I take an SAT exam, which is a kind of a, it's a you know I don't think a lot of people will uh, will kind of expose themselves in that way, but uh, and 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 uh, but but I think it's an incredibly valuable experience because no one you, you never actually get to see that in, in real life. In so many ways, we never get the opportunity to look over the shoulder of a practitioner of any right. discipline. And this has been one of my biggest hopes for the medium of internet video, as a matter of fact, is that exactly that becomes possible. And, um, you know, I've thought a lot about how in earlier incarnations of human society, that was really the norm. You know, I mean, when you were living in a tribal or a village kind of a situation, the work that people did was visible to you, right? You just had to look and right. see what people were doing. It was just out there in the open. And so, you know, I mean, part of education was just seeing what people did. Right. And uh, in a funny kind of way, I realized that, you know, when we got to this mode where we're all in cubicles with with keyboards and screens, um, but, we're, but we're communicating through email and we're communicating through these other, you know, sort of mediated channels. In a way, we we actually lose the ability to watch other people to see how they work with their tools to see how their minds work. Right. And, and so like recapturing that is a, is a really interesting possibility for the, the medium of internet video. And, and you're a great illustration of that. Yeah, no, I a hundred percent agree. And I think that extends even beyond what I'm doing. I have a, uh, I'll, I'll say, I'll, I'll, I won't name him because his, well, the, the story isn't flattering to his company, but he, he's kind of used my example and, he does analytics at a company and he, he was running some reports and instead of writing a white paper on, on what this report means or how do you run it and uh, like, like you would traditionally do in a, in a corporation, he told his, the CEO of the company, hey, you know, I have this buddy. He does this thing on YouTube using Camtasia. How about I do the same thing? Instead of writing a white paper on how to do it, how about I just capture my screen while I do it and I'll talk out loud? And, yeah. and you know, I thought it was a brilliant idea. What, what, what better way than the guy who's kind of writing it to learn from you know, looking over his shoulder, how he does it, mm -hmm. uh, but 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 she thought it was silly, <laughs> just because I think it's not uh, it's not how the other corporations do it, or it's not how all the other corporations she worked for did it. Uh, but but I think it's going to happen. I think I think uh, a lot of these short technical papers are are going to become obsolete because people can just look over someone's shoulder and see how they do it in real time. There's a a video that you may have seen by this this guy Hans Rosling. He he wrote the Gapminder software, which is this uh, pretty incredible data visualization. He's given a couple of TED Talks. And and what you realize when you see him giving one of these presentations is that, you know, it's only partly about the high quality animated visualizations, which the software can produce. It's also about how he performs the, and, and the presentation around that. And, right. right? And, and so it's the combination of, of him, you know, using the software along with his voice, along with his body in this case, you know, to, 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 to illustrate that that is incredibly powerful. And again, and again, it scales. And then what I wanted to get to, though, was what, you know, where, where are the limitations still and what, how can we address them? So, you know, one thing a person doesn't get to do is interact with you. It's one way um, in, in the course of these videos. Um, so it's, 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 not sort of a complete replacement, uh, you know, for much or some of what happens in school. 
it's, however, a, a useful complement. And I have, you know, read some, um, some, some indications that people are beginning to combine your stuff with classrooms and interactive settings. Um, but what, so what do you think about that? Yeah, you know, when I started this, I, you know, that that was kind of my sense is, oh, well, you know, it doesn't have the interactivity of a of a live one on one session. Um, but but, it, you know, I, I'm kind of I've come to the conclusion, I don't want to be too uh, grandiose about its potential. But I, I do think that it is actually be- I mean, I think it's, it's hands down better than the than the uh, professor sitting in front of a, a classroom of 300 students and just lecturing a prepared kind of scripted lecture to them. Uh, you know, it, it, one that's kind of artificial. Uh, the it's a 90 minute long thing. It's, you know, it may not be, it's probably not catering to all of the students. Some of the students are lost. Some are bored. Uh, they, they might be sleepy. You know, it's just not the time. Uh, there's, they, there's they no, learn. there's no question about that. And so here you're getting it when you want it, you're getting it in, in kind of granular chunks and you can pause, repeat. If, if, if I say orthogonal and you don't know what that means, you can look it up on, you can pause, look it up on Wikipedia. You can go look at the other video that I've done on orthogonality and, and fill in the blanks just to, to review. So, so I think on a lot of levels, it's, you know, like my cousin said, I think it's I, it's uh, I, I'm 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 better, and, and a lot of lectures would be better on YouTube than than live. I, I think the and and then there's also the opportunity to really tweak it, where you know YouTube gives me data on on where attention span drops off on my videos, yes. and so if something unusual happens in one of my videos, I can go back to that point, see what happened, maybe record another video if it's if it's because I threw out a weird concept or I skipped a step or whatever. So there's also this exactly. this potential of really tweaking and, and eventually we're, you know, and that's why I want to do the software and I've, I've been working on the software because I want to see how people interact with exercises before and after the video interaction. To, so, yeah. you know, attention span is one thing, but I also want to see whether they learned. Uh, and, and so you can uh, imagine a world where you can, uh, you make a video or I make a video or we make multiple versions of the same video and we just see which ones work best for different people. So oh, the potential, ab- absolutely. Absolutely. Th- there's yeah. things that have never been imagined with traditional, I think, uh, you know, but the limitation I think it's just that notion that there's this individual who cares directly about you. So uh, when I first worked with my cousins, I think it's that idea of uh, my 12-year-old cousin feeling like her 20 – at the time I was 26-year-old uh, cousin who you know took time out of his day to, to mentor her. I think that's incredibly, incredibly valuable. But I think – you know, frankly, that's not going on in the school system right now, right? Right now, you're lucky if you have a conversation with your teacher in, in, in the class of 30, and it's, it's usually the problem kids who are having a, the, the most time with the teacher, and it's not a positive uh, interaction. Yeah, uh, well, I'll tell you a, a funny story about yeah. some some other educational videos that I've seen. I was um, I, I, I catch a lot of this stuff in podcast form, and at one point, I was doing uh, I was kind of auditing a, a, a course on evolutionary biology out of, um, I think it was Berkeley. And so I, I remembered actually something I had seen in that course a couple of years before. And I wanted to use that insight in something I was writing on my blog. And so I went back to try to find it. And um, when I went back to look at it, 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 I wound up doing the video instead of the audio like I usually do. And my daughter, who was just getting ready to enter college, was looking over my shoulder while I was playing this video and she said so do the students just sit there <laughs> and i was like yeah i mean in a, in a large lecture they do right but then the other weird thing about that was that when i finally found that installment of the course he wasn't as good what, what they had done is they had replaced this semester's version with the version from two years ago that i had seen and he'd been better two years ago <laughs> right. It was like, you know, he actually had the more effective version. And so why not just can that and reuse that and use the class time for, you know, supplementary kinds of things or interactive kinds of things. Right. Yeah. That's, I've got a, uh, several letters from teachers. That's exactly they're starting to assign the videos uh, instead of reading and homework. And then you do your homework in, in class. And that's where you really benefit from exactly. one having the teacher there, but even more having your peers there. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I think that that will be really fruitful and something else that I'm interested in is the notion that, you know, you talked about caring about the intuition and, and transmitting the intuition and, and that happens in a pretty personal way for you. And so, you know, what we get is this view sort of through your eyes of how these intuitions made sense to you, which is great because a lot of times that doesn't come front and center. Um, you know, if we start to get a few more people like you out there as well, and we can start to triangulate on these things, it'll be even better because, you know, ultimately 
there might be some, you know, some other person like you might have a way of thinking about it that works better for me. Absolutely. And if I could access in the context of a particular, uh, you know, subject, if I could triangulate and assemble, well, you know, here's Sal's way of thinking about it. And here's somebody else's way of thinking about it. Right. And, you know, if I can pull those things together, which really, you know, just through sort of tagging things on, on, on services like YouTube, wouldn't be that hard to let happen in a pretty loosely coupled way. Oh yeah. I think there's, I mean, you could, right. Just from people reviewing it or tagging it, you could start to understand what will respond with different people or, or maybe people could use multiple viewpoints. Uh, but, but then if you, if you really do couple that with, uh, you know, exercises where you're, where you're able to track everything and do some analytics, then you can do some pretty profound and, you know, really scientifically determine, uh, what, what works for different people. Right. So, so say a little bit more about the, the software that you're, you're working on and what it will do and, and where it's going. Yeah, it already exists on the site. I've I've actually just uh, had to had to port it to a, a, a app engine just because it was too many people were using it. I guess it's not a a bad problem when you're the only when you're the support staff and engineering staff. <laughs> it's a so uh, but but it's it, the the idea is very simple. It starts at one plus one equals two. It just uh, generates random problems, and uh, you got to uh, each module is is like a concept, like basic addition. One plus one equals two. Two plus three is equal to five, and uh, you got to get ten in a row. Once you have Ten in a row uh, on that, and that's a, that's a you know something that doesn't happen in the school system. No one expects you to get ten in a row. They they expect you to get seventy percent right, and then you move on. But mm. uh, you get ten in a row, and then it's kind of a, a if you can imagine a node directed graph. I have something called a knowledge map, and uh, you know uh, your basic addition. Once you get ten in a row, you've then fulfilled the prerequisites for level two addition and basic subtraction, and then those fulfill the prerequisites, and you have this uh, this node directed graph. And right now it goes up through. Pretty much all of Algebra 2 and trigonometry, uh, my, the first wave of the, the videos on YouTube go well beyond that. They go you know, into college-level math and physics and chemistry. But the software, uh, the idea is to, to have it at least cover everything that you would have to know for the SAT or the ACT or, mm -hmm. or, or take the GED. And uh, the, the idea is to kind of give – and the problems are randomly generated. So if it takes you 500 problems to understand negative exponents – you're going to get 500 problems, and in the process, it's tracking everything you do. It knows when you're, and the videos are uh, coupled into it. So if you get a problem, uh, if you know how to do it, you can you can type in the answer. If you don't know how to do it, you can click hints. It'll give you the the the, the steps for that exact problem. If you still don't know how to do it, you can click video, and the video from YouTube will pipe in. So uh, what what I kind of envision doing is is closing the loop between instruction. Uh, practice and assessment and making them all happen simultaneously as mm -hmm. opposed to the traditional model where I lecture to you, I give you homework, which you do in a complete vacuum without any feedback because the <laughs> textbooks aren't giving you any feedback and you may or may not know how to do it. And then we kind of keep going in that cycle for a week or two and then I give you an exam, you get a C. So you clearly have some deficiencies, but too bad, we have to move on to the next concept. So uh, uh, the model here is just close the loop and, and, and don't let anyone have any deficiencies before they move on. So is it also the case that you're starting to get telemetry that's telling you something about the videos, how they're being used, and what the before and after comparison is? I, the, the software integration, I've, I've, I've done it uh, pretty heavily with a couple of uh, summer camps out here in the Bay Area, and, and it's, I, I haven't... I haven't gotten to the point yet where I'm, you know, I'm testing two videos on the same concept. I don't have a lot of, you know, multiple videos for the same concept yet. So I, so I'm tweaking on that level, but yeah. we, we have seen, uh, we, we did it with a group of, uh, of rising eighth graders. These were uh, low and middle income, mainly minority students. And this was a summer program to get them prepared for algebra and pre-algebra. And uh, we saw it when we started the students at one plus one equals two there was just some subset of students who had just very, very basic deficiencies, subtracting decimals or uh, uh, multiplying negative numbers. And, 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 and you could see it in the data that they spent a little bit more time on those concepts than everyone else in the class. Everyone else thought it was just a, a review, but these students, it was a gap. But once they got through that gap, they raced forward and they were just as hmm. good as anybody else. Hmm. And I, I think that speaks to why there's a lot of, if you go into an algebra class today, there's a lot of great teachers with uh, high potential students talking past each other because the the teacher can't address the 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 arithmetic issue and the teach and the student may not even know they have that deficiency or even if they do they're they're embarrassed to bring it up so so when you allow people to kind of do this at their own pace uh, you do see it in the data that that uh, it's actually hard to predict who's going to end up at, at different points because if you give someone a time to fill in the fill in their gaps uh, you you might have thought that they were a slow student before but once that gap is filled they they actually progress quite fast it, it seems. On the one hand, 
unimaginable that we could be here in the 21st century and not have widely available tools online already for people to do those kinds of things, to do those kinds of remediations. But on the other hand, I guess it seemed kind of unimaginable that millions of people would be driving past this freeway intersection in Los Angeles right. and you know nobody bothered to to tell them where North yeah, Five you know, was. Here, you know, you know the free you know the 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 freeway intersection that that one's actually that one's uh that one's in, in the education context there, there are some obvious forces as to why that's not that that doesn't exist today. Obviously, I think everyone who's trying to innovate in education is trying to do it within the current context. So they're yeah. trying to go into uh, school systems and try to incrementally change what teachers are doing one way or the other. So it's, it's, it's very hard to kind of move the beast, so to speak. Uh, and then, and then you have all these people on the, on, on the for-profit realm and I don't know, they're, they're just trying to sell something for 1995 a month. And I don't think they're, they're thinking too deeply about how to yeah. do it right, yeah. regardless of economic consequences. No, you're right. It, I think it, it almost has to come from the outside. And, um, I don't know if you know Graham Glass. He's a friend of mine, and he's working on a, a service called Edu 2.0. Um, Edu 2.0. Yeah, okay, I'll, okay. yeah. You might be you might be curious about that. His um, he he's coming at it from a you know partly from a courseware perspective, but also uh, from very much from a, a project based learning perspective, where the notion is so it's kind of like this, right? You know, I could have in my school, I could have a kid who is interested in. I don't know, um, you know, uh, making and flying rockets. And right. there might or might not be somebody in the school who could mentor the kid. Um, and if there is, then you have one of those lucky circumstances where the kid right. has a great experience. And if not, you know, that, that, um, that capability goes un, untapped in the kid. But um, on, on the internet, we have the possibility to, to bring people together across time and space, right? So, right. Um, you know, you have the possibility of bringing a mentor in from someplace else and, you know, assembling uh, mentors and, and students in that way and, and, and letting them actually then, you know, pursue the stuff that excites them and, and, and do things. And so that's a nice kind of complementary uh, model. But again, I mean, it's, you know, he's, he's coming completely from the outside and I think, that's that's probably where all the interesting action is going to be. It's going to have to be. Right. No, I I, I agree. You know, I think I think that's where it's all going. I think you have, you know, you have something like Khan Academy has video content. It's going to have software. It's going to do analytics on on what's working for different students and where different students are. But then you overlay that with a, a kind of a peer to peer interaction, like like you just described, where the software knows that uh, for Sal the videos haven't been enough, and and even the software. He's struggling with it, so uh, why do let me schedule? And I know his schedule, and I know uh, a schedule of a uh, of, of a young woman in in I don't know in Mexico City who who's proven through the, through the through the 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 site that that she knows what she's doing and she's mm -hmm. a highly regarded tutor. Maybe she might be the same age as Sal or a little older, or maybe a a, a practicing engineer or, or who knows what. And and you pair them up, and then you but then you capture. You could even record the interaction, and then you you capture the data, the before the after of, of Sal's performance and, and yes. his ratings. And then all of a sudden you have a very uh, a rich kind of peer to peer across time and space uh, uh, interactions amongst amongst people all over. And obviously that has other other implications beyond just you know teaching people math it, it, it can it can do a lot in terms of just awareness yeah another another guy I should mention here is uh, Tim Falberg who's a math teacher and he got interested in in making well he called he actually has a coined a term for these things math casts and he's been right. he's been doing them with Camtasia for a long time and one of the great things that he told me about a project where they were working with I think it was elementary school kids in Australia is that he wound up having those kids make educational videos for each other. Yeah. Right. And so that they got to, you know, be the teacher and in the process of teaching, as you do when you teach, they also learned really well. And um, so they have, they have a nice little collection of these um, problem solving videos made by, you know, fourth graders in, in Perth or Sydney or somewhere. And, and, and oh, that's it, huge. It I, is. Yeah, it's a beautiful I think that thing. should be done on a massive on a massive scale and you know even even if you have a thousand versions of you know uh, adding negative numbers from a thousand students i think as you said just just them do, going through the motions of doing it they're going to get a lot deeper understanding but but even better uh, that there's no, i mean even I, I like to review some of my own 
I mean, it, it, what's better than notes? It's, it's your, your own recording of how you thought about it two months ago when you were really deeply in, engaged in it. So you have that aspect. And, and then you have the aspect you, you might be able to identify the, the next, you know, the next great teacher that way as well. Exactly. Exactly. And, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll throw this out. I, I think, I think great teachers were great when they were 13. I don't think much happens between 13 and 30. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's true. And, you know, in the, in the Bill Gates TED talk that I, that I just watched, they said something similar, which is that, um, you know, they're, you know, that actually teachers in their first couple of years go through uh, an experience curve, but after that, they're, they're pretty much where they're going to be. You know, right. Anyway, and, you know, in the traditional school system, though, that, that experience curve is all around classroom management. You know, I've talked to some of my friends who are teachers, and they're like, "Well, you know, you don't have to do this." The trouble, and it's true, I don't have to do any of that. And as right. I think that's where a lot of the experience curve is. Uh, uh, more than, uh, I mean, there is, you know, it, it's, you're teaching a 30 or 25 kids. So it's a different concept than, uh, but, but I think this being able to explain in, in a kind of a patient and empathetic way, what, what, you know, on YouTube, I think that's something that, uh, you know, what, what, once, once you have a little bit of maturity, you'll, you'll probably be able to do as good as you'll ever be able to do it. Yeah. So have you gotten into areas where you are teaching yourself things that you hadn't previously known or known well? Oh yeah, tons of. I mean, that. Uh, frankly, that's that's the real fun for me is that I get to revisit some things that you know I I just kind of did fairly superficially when I was in school, and and now I get to really dive deep in a on on my own time frame without any pressure, and really get to understand what those concepts are. I, I mean, the one example I was given is entropy. I, I wasn't a chemistry jock in high school. I just kind of did what I needed to do to do well in the class, but I didn't know it intuitively the way I I might have known math or computer science. Mm -hmm. uh, so so you know that that's been a great experience for me. I, I started in September and I really just for two months I just became a chemistry geek hmm. and I would call up my friends who are professors at Stanford and MIT and say hey let's talk about entropy <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's amazing I mean I, I think the one, one point of feedback I got from them is they, they envied me because never in their uh, when they were doing their PhDs they, they, they couldn't go to their advisor and say let's talk about entropy because that's something that that you were supposed to have known when you when you took AP chemistry or uh, <laughs> freshman level of chemistry, but but the reality is very few people do have an intuition of say entropy, including some professors today. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so I, it was I mean you know actually entropy is the example is I, once I, I I was able to kind of uh, get the idea distilled in my mind, I realized that most explanations out there were on some level wrong. Hmm. In what way? Well, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, the way you learn it in chemistry class, your teacher says uh, entropy is disorder, and which isn't incorrect, but they they say a clean room has low entropy and a dirty room has high entropy, and so you know you go to the exa exam, they say okay, this room is dirty, this room is clean, which one has higher entropy, and you just kind of write it down, and that's wrong it's it's the it's it's missing the whole point of what entropy is and it took me a while to to kind of distill this idea is that when in 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 chemistry or in thermodynamics you you have uh macrostates and microstates uh, microstates are you're looking at a particular atom and you're looking at its kinetic energy you're looking at its momentum you're looking at you know the vector of its velocity and and if you looked at the microstate of every little atom in a container you could run a computer simulation and then maybe you might figure out what might happen the very next moment uh, those are microstates uh, macrostates are you look at the whole container and and you 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 describe all of the particles uh you kind of almost you can think of statistics for all of the, the particles so temperature is a macrostate it's the average kinetic energy for all of the particles. And so entropy, similarly, is a macro state, but it's almost a meta macro state. It's, it's this idea of not what state are the particles in, it's how many potential states can the particles have. Hmm. So in the messy clean room analogy, the reason why I say that's wrong is because each of those are particular states. It doesn't say a messy room if it's, you know, it depends on what level you're thinking about the states, but it, it, it has the same number of, you know, because of its temperature and its, it, its atoms have the same number of uh, potential states as, as the clean room. Uh, if, if a, I guess I'll give you a, a really hot uh, clean room with things flying around in the air uh, is, is, is going to be, have higher entropy than a, uh, than a, a cold, dirty room with, where things aren't flying around the air. <laughs> so, so it's, it's the number of states that, that something can have. And, and you can even translate that into computer science. It's the amount of information you need to describe the state of a, of a system. So something that can have more states, you need to have more bits to describe its particular state. And that's completely lost. At least it was in the chemistry classes I took. 
Hmm. That's good. That's good. I bet one of the one of the other areas that's going to be very fruitful for you in coming years is energy literacy. Oh yeah, um, you know, and then, you know, these are questions that I, I, you know, I, I got a lot of a lot of people request, uh, you know, a lot of clean tech lectures. A lot of people want me to kind of settle the global warming debate, the healthcare debate, and you know, these are things that. I, I look forward to eventually. I don't know if I'm going to be able to catch up with the kind of the the new cycle, uh, but but I, I I mean I think there is that opportunity where I can dig deep into things, and uh, as objectively as possible, I think people trust me because they learned calculus from me. Uh, that that I'm not I don't have a pol a political kind of axe to grind, and and I can give them a, a fairly objective, hopefully objective, uh, a take on things. Well, when I say energy literacy, I'm talking about. I mean, so to give you an example, I was looking at some of your stuff the other day, and I've also been. Recently, I've been hanging around on Wolfram Alpha a lot because it's a, a really helpful way of making conversions between units and different forms of energy and matter and so on and, 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 and understanding, you know, like, like you'll, sit, you'll say, uh, I don't know, I, I put in my electric bill was uh, such and such kilowatt hours. It was like 1,200 kilowatt hours, right? And I'm like, well, what is that, right? What does that really right. mean? You know, and, and it'll give it to you in terms of gasoline. Oh, that's cool. You know, as a society, we are broadly speaking feeling like we need to have a better handle on what does this stuff really mean in terms that we can freely interconvert, and and we're not so good at that. But um, you know, I went from one of your examples back to Wolfram Alpha, and was thinking uh, it was I guess it was just the you know the the elevator that weighs so much and is you know 100 meters off the ground and it's got this much potential energy. And this much kinetic energy when it hits the, the floor, and I, I I looked at that relative to gallons of gasoline and kilowatt hours of my electric bill, and it was like, wow, <laughs> you know, I, I wouldn't have thought this, but apparently, I, I you know the energy I burn as electricity in my home in a day could take an elevator to the top of the Empire State Building ten or twenty times. Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have thought that, right? And that, no, that, that, no, you're right. I mean, that that is interesting. I mean, that's that's something, and, and it gives people a context for what, yeah, what a kilowatt hour is, what a what a uh, what what a calorie is, what a uh, yeah, what what a uh, a kill, you know, uh, any any of the above. Yeah, because we we really but, do we really lack those intuitions. It kind it kind right. of struck me because I wrote about this on my blog, and I realized, you know, all my life I've thought about electric bills as dollars. Right. And, and I, I mentioned something about, well, this is my electric bill. It was this many kilowatt hours. And people wrote in from Belgium and, and, and the Netherlands, and they said, really? And what made me surprised was that I suddenly realized, you know what? They have an intuition about what it means to be a quantity of kilowatt hours, right? right. They don't, it's like, it's not the, the first order for them isn't, isn't dollars or, 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 or euros. It's kilowatt hours. That actually means something to them in a way it doesn't yeah. to us, right? And that I don't know. I thought that was. No, that's you're you're inspiring me to do a pl uh, at least a, a couple of videos on. This. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, listen, um, I, I you know I, I think I should let you get back to this this stuff that you do, and I don't really have a lot else to to ask you, but I, I just um, you know I want to thank you for 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 what you're doing. I think it's brilliant, and um, I I. I'm happy to see it happening. I'm happy for you to to be excited and, and enjoying doing this. And I, and I know that you're going to find a way to to make this work out as a as a profession, as a career, as a as a you know a lifetime mission. No, great. I appreciate. It. No, I, I have that gut feeling. I mean, it's, it's being done as a not for profit, but yeah, we need to get to the point that uh, the not for profit can can pay my rent. So yeah, there's, <laughs> a, there's there's no way that there's no way in my mind there's no way that can't happen. But yeah, I, I'm I'm getting that gut feeling. Hope, hopefully, you'll hear some uh, interesting news from from us in the. Well, well I, I don't want to jinx us, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Sal. Well, thanks a lot, John. You've been listening to Interviews with Innovators with host John Udell. Our audio files are delivered by Limelight Networks, the high-performance content delivery network for digital media. The Conversations Network is a 501c3 nonprofit, and we need your help. For a tax-deductible donation of as little as $5 per month, you can support this channel and the rest of the Conversations Network. So please visit conversationsnetwork.org to become a member and help us continue to bring our programs to the world for free. The post-production audio engineer for this program was John Udell. Our website editor was Joel Cherney. The series producer is Joel Cherney. This is Phil Wendley. 
I hope you'll join me next time for another great edition of Interviews with Innovators on IT Conversations.